Okay, so hi, my name is Sebastian Budden. I'm a founding member of Historical Materialism Journal and the book series and the conferences, some of which you will already be familiar with. So I want to just to pitch to you the idea of you uh, subscribing to the journal, firstly. The journal comes out four times a year, published by Brill, over a thousand pages of uh, extremely important and stimulating uh, Marxist theory and Marxist history. Um, we have a discount at the moment for individual subscribers around the time of the, the London conference, and we very strongly uh, both request and uh, demand that you subscribe to the journal, that you uh, get other people to subscribe to the journal, and of course that you get uh, your institution, if you're part of a university or other institutions, to subscribe to the journal. We need more subscribers for this project to be able to expand and continue. The second thing I really wanted to push was the book series. Uh, the book series you also probably be familiar with. It's published by Brill Academic Press, and then all the volumes come out 12 months later with Haymarket Books in Chicago, paperbacks. Um, we have more than 200 volumes published now of translations of original work, of document collections, of uh, translations from uh, Marxist theory from across the world, from Japan to uh, uh, China to um, India to Latin America, very important cool Latin American list shaping up in the book series and so on. Um, it's a really crucial intervention in Marxist uh, literature in, the, in making Marxist theory available um, that really hasn't existed on this scale since the 1970s. So we'd like you to look at the book series, buy individual volumes, perhaps take up the offer of the book club that Haymarket is, uh, is, is uh, promoting. And also, of course, if, you get, if you're part of an institution, to get your institution to buy as many volumes as possible. Uh, those are the two key elements of our activity, aside from the conference, the journal and the book series. And we think it would be, uh, well, we think it's essential, basically, for us, for our existence, for us to be able to continue to thrive for those to expand. So please, subscribe to the journal, buy the books and the book series, publicize both around you, and help us build the historical materials and project. Hello, everyone. Um, delighted to be chairing this um, session with the um, annual um, Deutscher Isaac and the Tamara Deutscher Prize uh, lecture this year um, with uh, John Bellamy Foster, who was awarded the 2020 um, Deutscher Prize for his fantastic book, uh, The Return uh, of Nature. John uh, will be uh, speaking to us. The, there is a video available uh, on YouTube. You might have received the, the link. And the paper coming from this uh, talk today will be published by Historical Materialism. We have three speakers uh, today. I'm just here chairing. My name is Alfredo Saad Filho. Uh, we have three speakers today. The first will be uh, John Bellamy Foster, uh, celebrating the uh, award of the prize. Uh, then we will have two discussants, uh, Professor Helena Sheehan, uh, Emeritus Professor of Philosophy of Science and History of Ideas at Dublin City University. Helena has been active on the left for many years, and some of her books are Marxism uh, and the Philosophy of Science, The Series of Wave, uh, and Navigating the Zeitgeist. Um, then we'll have comments by Stefano Longo, who is Associate Professor of Sociology at North Carolina State University and visiting researcher in climate and environment at Lund University in Sweden. And his work focuses on social ecological systems, looking particularly at marine uh, ecosystems, political economy, and food systems. And he's also the author of The Tragedy of the Commodity, uh, written together with Rebecca Clausen and Brett Clark. But the big prize. Uh, this evening is to uh, John Bellamy Foster. Uh, as I mentioned previously, he was awarded the 2020 um, Isaac and Tamara Deutsche Memorial Prize uh, for the return uh, of nature. And John will be speaking to us. The title of the talk and the title of the paper is The Return of the Dialectics of Nature, the Struggle for Freedom as Necessity. John uh, is uh, the editor 
uh, of the monthly review and he's professor of sociology at the University of Oregon. And he has published a very uh, substantial number of books, The Theory of Monopoly Capitalism, The Vulnerable Planet in Defense of History, Marx's Ecology, Ecology Against Capitalism, The Ecological Rift, What Every Environmentalist Needs to Know About Capitalism, Marx in the Earth, The Age of Monopoly Capital, The Robbery of Nature, The Return of Nature, which is this book that just won the prize, and Capitalism in the Anthropocene uh, that uh, is already uh, finished, is, is in production to be launched uh, next year. So it's, they, this, this prize is a celebration of this fantastic output uh, in general by John and of this a celebration of this book uh, in particular. Now, I will now um, ask or invite John to take the floor. But before I do that, uh, I would like to announce the um, 21, uh, 2021 uh, shortlist for the uh, Deutsche Prize. Um, we had uh, six uh, books shortlisted uh, this year. Uh, the prize, as everyone uh, here will know, is awarded every year to the book that uh, exemplifies the best and the most innovative writing in or about the Marxist uh, tradition. And the shortlist for uh, this year's prize, uh, it includes uh, six books. Uh, it uh, includes uh, Caesarism and Bonapartism in Gramsci, uh, Hegemony and the Crisis of Modernity by Francesca Antonini. Um, the Ideological Condition, uh, Selected Essays on History, Race and Gender by Himani Banerjee. Uh, jurisdictional Accumulation, uh, An Early Modern History of Law, Empires and Capital uh, by Maya Pal. Uh, a Philosophy for Communism, Rethinking Al Pusser by Panagiotis Sotiris. Um, Stalin, Passage to Revolution uh, by Ronald Grigol Suni. And Capitalism as Civilization, A History of International Law by Ntina Tsubala. And I will now announce um, the winner of the Deutsche uh, prize uh, 2021 that will be celebrated with the lecture next year. And the winner of the Deutsche Prize uh, this year is um, Stalin by um, uh, uh, Ronald Gregor uh, Suni. This is an absolutely stunning uh, biography of the young Stalin, covering the period from his childhood uh, to the uh, Russian uh, Revolution. So, and it stops there. It covers in extraordinary detail, uh, the, an extremely interesting and influential life. Uh, and uh, I totally recommend this book to, uh, to all comrades here. So let me now uh, then um, give the floor to John uh, Bellamy Foster and he'll give us uh, the uh, Deutsche lecture uh, uh, for, um, this, uh, for this year. John, the floor is yours. Hello, well, uh, the Deutscher lecture is in, entitled The Return of the Dialectics of Nature, The Struggle for Freedom as Necessity. And uh, there's a, a written extended version of the lecture that will be published in Historical Materialism next year. And uh, I did a, a brief, a brief uh, extemporaneous video lecture, which is available on YouTube through historical materialism. And I've been asked to um, give a briefer summary uh, here of, of uh, some of the main points. So I want you to understand that this is in not, not in any way complete. And I hope that for those of you who are interested, you will, you will read the, the written version of the lecture when it's uh, published uh, next year. A fundamental, premise of Marxism is that as material conditions change, uh, so do our ideas about the world. And since we're in a period of such fundamental material change, we have to uh, reconsider everything. But this isn't something that happens in a linear fashion, because uh, in the process of changing our ideas, we, we have to draw on the past in order to revolutionize the present and the future. Right now, we're in a planetary emergency. I'm going to emphasize this rather than 
the uh, economic crisis of, of global capitalism, which is also going on and uh, which we need to talk about. But um, the, the um, reality is that uh, right now we're in a planetary emergency. And the, the, the easiest way to understand this is the uh, emergence of what uh, scientists, what uh, uh, geologists and natural scientists and generally, generally have called um, the Anthropocene epoch. We, um, uh, for the last 11,700 years, we've been living in the Holocene epoch, uh, the um, a period in which, uh, in which the climate has been quite mild and civilization has developed. Now um, science and earth system science, geologists, uh, climatologists say that we're in the Anthropocene epoch. And what defines the Anthropocene is the, the fact that human beings, anthropogenic forces, basically anthropogenic forces, obviously acting through society, are now the primary factors in earth system change for the first time in, in all of, of um, the history of the planet. And this changes everything. Now, according to the science, uh, the, this uh, occurred around uh, 1945 with the first nuclear detonations, appearance of radio nucleides and, and the appearance of plastics in, in the 1950s and what we, what's called the great acceleration uh, that uh, of the economy environmental effects at that time. So uh, the Anthropocene is, is traced back to the late 1940s, uh, early 1950s. And it's at this point that, uh, that uh, human beings uh, began to affect the entire earth system, be, became the principal factor in, in the alteration of uh, the entire earth system. Uh, humanity uh, affected the earth, of course, for thousands of years, but, um, but uh, um, altering, changing, affecting the entire earth system is something new. Basically, we can understand this in terms of um, of uh, the biogeochemical cycles of the planet, the, the Anthropocene can be defined as, as and has been defined, uh, or the coming of the Anthropocene is uh, defined in terms of an anthropogenic rift in the biogeochemical cycles of the planet. Uh, that's, that defines the Anthropo Anthropocene crisis uh, that we're, we're now in. I'll talk about that more later. Uh, but the Anthropocene as a whole, as a concept, simply means that human beings uh, are the, the main factor in altering the earth. And this isn't going to change, even if capitalism goes away, something I'll talk about later. We, um, as long as we have industrial civilization uh, from now on, uh, as, and as long as, uh, as human society uh, continues, we will be in this, this uh, situation. Now, uh, this coming of the Anthropocene in the, in the late 1940s and early 1950s coincided with the rise of the modern environmental movement. It's no accident that the environmental movement started in the early 1950s uh, with uh, the, uh, led by scientists in a struggle against uh, radioactive uh, contamination, uh, basically from, from H-bomb tests. And then uh, the, um, the movement expanded um, beyond that to other kinds of toxics. Uh, for example, Rachel Carson in the 1960s, who really came out of the, the uh, anti-nuclear uh, radiation movement. And uh, the, um, the environmental movement uh, skyrocketed from that point, but it was the struggle against radionuclides and against uh, toxics that uh, started the modern environmental movement. And it happened at the same time that um, the early 1950s, uh, when we, um, we um, what, 
the period which we now see as the beginning of the Anthropocene. So we've been in a planetary emergency, but now it's, it's much more serious uh, that um, although the human um, beings really began to affect the Earth system in the, in the 1950s, uh, now um, it's gone so far that um, human survival is possibly jeopardized. And, and uh, so ecology is something that is, is now the dominant issue of our time simply because uh, it, uh, it is the fundamental crisis, the greatest uh, crisis that uh, humanity has ever faced, the greatest challenge. And um, in the 1980s, uh, there was a lot of discussion about, well, how, why did Marxists uh, not deal with ecology? Why didn't Marx not, not deal with ecology, address ecology? Uh, ecology was seen as coming out of uh, the romantic poets and romantic literature or out of Malthusian population theory. And Marxism was seen as having uh, often characterized even by Marxists as not having taken the environment seriously. I, I was uh, very clear that this was, was wrong. And uh, I started uh, addressing this problem in the late 1980s and in my book, The Vulnerable Planet in 1994. But as I, I um, dove into research into classical political economy and Marxian theory on the ecological question, I realized uh, that uh, Marx was not um, was not uh, only a marginal commentator, as was often uh, said on the environment, uh, that he only dealt with it on the margins of his analysis, but that it was it was central to his thought, and uh, that in many ways, uh, in terms of the ecological critique, encompassing both both uh, uh, nature and society or external nature and society. Marx was, was more advanced um, than any other uh, thinker in his time and actually created the templates for our for a, a critical ecological understanding. And uh, this I tried to explain in 1999 in my, um, my um, article, Marx's Theory of Metabolic Rift for the American Social for the American Journal of Sociology, Paul Burkett, who I was working with, came out with his Marx and Nature at the same time, dealing with the more economic aspects of the, the more value-related aspects. And I, but I was puzzled by uh, the fact that Marx actually, in, in his analysis of metabolic rift, which most of you are familiar with now, had, had uh, penetrated so deeply into the, the uh, robbing of, of nature, the, the uh, disruption of, 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 of the metabolism between human beings and nature or the disruption of, of the social metabolism and how far reaching this was and how deep it went into the science. And I didn't believe for a moment that he got this just from reading Justice von Liebig, uh, which of course uh, Liebig was very influential um, marks on this. So I went back, I decided to go back to the beginning and, um, and, Marx is, and, and Marx's ecology, which came out in 2000, was about, the, was about Marx's materialism, really. It's most famous for the chapter on the metabolic rift, but I went back to the roots of Marx's materialism in, in his dissertation on Epicurus and moved forward from there, also analyzing the relationship between Marx and Darwin and, and so on to understand materialism because Marxists had generally forgotten about, forgotten what materialism was. I was a political economist and, um, but you know, the way we dealt with materialism is materialism had to do with simply with economics. It had to do simply with productive forces. But obviously there was a deeper conception of materialism. There's, um, there's not only the materials conception of history, which Marx pioneered in, but there was underlying that a materialist conception of nature within science that he built upon and understanding how those interrelated 
and how they were related to dialectics was crucial. So in Marx's ecology, I tried to do that. But, and it was, it was a fairly straightforward analysis and, and uh, particularly with respect to, to um, the metabolic rift. But the question um, came up about, uh, well, what happened after Marx? Um, people immediately said, well, yeah, this is all true. This is correct. We've discovered that Marx is not, wasn't an anti-environmentalist, but, but one of the most formidable e uh, ecological thinkers of all time. Uh, because he he interconnected uh, the the social and the ecological in a way that no one else was able to do before or since, and uh, and yet people said, well, it it didn't um, lead to anything. There there was nothing after that. Fortunately, I'd read Helena Sheehan's uh, Marxism and the Philosophy of Science, and I knew a lot about um, uh, consequently about um, British Marxism, British, the Red Scientists in, in, in the British Isles in the interwar years. And um, it, it suggested to me that um, that was wrong. So the return of nature began with that inquiry, really um, in some ways inspired by Helena. And, uh, but uh, going forward um, from, from um, the, the, the deaths of, of Marx and Marx and Darwin. Uh, Darwin and Marx died in 1882 and 1883, respectively, and I ended the Marx, Marx's ecology there. And then the return of nature starts with their funerals. So um, I, I tried to carry the story forward all the way to the ecological movement of the, 18th, um, of the, of the 1960s, uh, 50s, 60s, and 70s. So, um, that was the purpose of the of uh, the return of nature, but um, there was immediately uh, a number of, of problems. Um, well, first of all, what I did discover, even though though um, it had um, been said that Marxism hadn't and socialists hadn't con contributed to uh, ecological analysis, I discovered that um, Marxists and socialists generally were uh, the leading formative figures in the development of uh, ecology and the ecological critique. Uh, and, um, and that it actually did go directly forward from Marx and Engels and that the, the, um, the analysis that they had left behind was crucial in, in building this. One thing in Marx's ecology is I had also stopped short of dealing with Engels's dialectics of nature in any kind of real substantive way, although it's mentioned in the book. And I've, I, I um, did not explore Marx's own approach to the dialectics of nature very extensively in that book, because I wanted to, because I had the idea of doing the return of nature already in mind and a, a serious um, confrontation with, with Engels's work was necessary to move on to the next stage to deal with the dialectics of nature. But this um, created another problem, a much bigger problem, because uh, in the beginning of the 1920s, a big chasm emerged in, in Marxist thought. Uh, the, um, two, uh, the two dominant traditions became the official Soviet Marxism, which held on to the conception of the dialectics of nature and dialectical materialism. And in the 1920s created um, re revolutionary ecological conceptions. The Soviet Union in the 20s and early 30s was the, had the most advanced ecological thinkers in the world, primar you know, primarily could be because they were building on these conceptions of dialectics. So the most important discoveries were all made in the in the Soviet Union, whether it was the origins of agriculture, um, the um, uh, you know, the uh, the origins uh, of life. Well, that was also um, in, discovered in Britain and 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 uh, and the Soviet Union. The um, um, the whole notion of of um, 
of the food web and all these ideas uh, first developed in, in the uh, Soviet Union. And, uh, but they, um, most of the, the ecologists, uh, the, environment, the leading thinkers uh, were victims of Stalin's purges. Um, most of them actually um, died. Uh, and, uh, and um, but before, before they were victims the, of the purges, as Helena explained so well, they, they, they uh, have visited this one conference in England in 1931 and lit a match that set off um, British Marxist science and which carried on their tradition even uh, after these thinkers had been purged uh, in the Soviet Union and created a kind of second foundation of Marxism um, so um, in the West. But the dominant tradition of Marxism in the West became Western Marxism or what's called Western Marxism, Western Marxist philosophical tradition. And uh, the, the uh, leading premise of Western Marxism was that uh, the dialectics of nature was, <laughs> was not uh, acceptable, that there, there was no dialectics. Um, within uh, nature as an objective realm. There was only a dialectics of society and of, of the subject of the human agent. So dialectics could not be applied to nature. Now this started with um, Lukács' history in class consciousness, his famous footnote six, which is about um, 10 lines long, but became you know, the basis of all of this. Um, but uh, Lukács said that Engels was wrong about the dialectics of nature. He didn't say exactly why, but he said he had followed um, he had followed Hegel's error. Uh, he'd been misled by by Hegel, Hegel and uh, and um, so Lukács abandoned both uh, Hegel's approach to uh, dialectics of nature, in a sense, and and Engels at one at. Uh, one time in this footnote, he, he said that the, this was not acceptable because dialectics was the realm of, of the reflexive subject, the identical subject object for him, the proletariat um, in history and class consciousness. So uh, under Vico's principle, we could understand the world because we have made it. And um, I, I, I was, um, I, I originally, um, believed in the dialectics of nature when I was in my uh, early teen, 20s, I guess. And, uh, and then I got to, I took my first critical theory course. They said in the very first sentence that Western Marxism is, means the rejection of the dialectics of nature. And, and uh, as long as I was dealing simply with society, I was dealing with economics, I thought that was fine. The Vikian principle is fine. You know, uh, there is the dialectics of society that's reflexive and we can work on that basis. But once you try and deal with uh, the material world in the wider sense, nature, ecology, it, it makes no sense at all. And uh, consequently, Western Marxism could uh, criticize technology as uh, affecting the environment, the domination of nature, but they couldn't consider nature at all or any um, a real social um, natural interactions. Um, the, what Marx, they couldn't consider what Marx called the universal metabolism of nature because um, that took uh, West, uh, Western Marxism in a direction that was considered unacceptable. And without the dialectics of nature, the um, Western Marxism couldn't have a materialist conception of nature. They were bound together, and so they were both abandoned. Uh, and but Lukács actually, in the other part of his book, he said that the merely objective dialectics of nature was rational. He um, he he said there was such a thing as a merely dialect uh, uh, objective dialectics of nature. It simply wasn't the same thing as. Um, as um, uh, the dialectics of the subject, of, uh, where where uh, you had um, complete reflexivity, uh, it was uh, dialectics of nature. Merely objective dialectics of nature was the dialectics of the uh, the detached observer. But what that meant was Lukács already was doing what Engels had done. Engels had referred to the merely 
injective dialectics of nature. And uh, they were creating a hierarchy of dialectics with um, there is a sense in which we can understand nature dialectically. And, um, and um, beyond that, um, the, there's the emergence within, within, uh, within nature of, of, um, of humanity, of society, uh, which is an emergent form, which has its own dialectical characteristics and where you can talk about the identical subject object. So Lukács already had a hierarchy and then in his later write, writing, he, um, he moves more and more in terms re, re um, establishing the dialectics of nature. Uh, I can maybe explain later how he does that. But at any rate, this was um, a real problem and Western Marxism actually wasn't being completely arbitrary on this. You have to understand that Lukács came from the neo-Kantian tradition and almost all the Western Marxists adopted uh, neo-Kantianism. Now we, we see Western Marxism, Marxism as primarily Hegelian, but they had to abandon Hegel's um, discussions of of um, material nature and of course, from an idealist standpoint, but he was dealing with the, the interchange with the, um, the complexity and the dialectics of it. They abandoned that part of Hegel completely. And uh, in terms of, on, uh, and they abandoned ontology um, altogether and um, followed the neo-Kantian tradition, which had reduced all of philosophy basically to epistemology, what, what Roy Boscar called the epistemic fallacy. So uh, everything was reduced to the theory of knowledge and in neo-Kantian terms, in, in terms of Kant where uh, the thing in itself, the noumena, um, the realm beyond human beings is beyond um, our understanding that um, so we, the, um, the, the world of nature gets split off from, from the human subject. Um, Kantianism and, and neo-Kantianism is inherently dualistic and Western Marxism took over that dualism, but it basically said, okay, the world of, of nature is, is, um, is, we'll leave that to the scientists. Uh, it can only be understood mechanistically and positivistically. And that's fine as, as long as it's in the realm of science. And we will deal with totality. We will deal with the dialectic and totality, but it will only relate to human beings in the social realm and not to the natural physical world. Well, from a materialist conception, that's actually inadequate, but we could go along with that for a long time, as long as we were approaching issues of, of nature as irrelevant, because after all, the view was well, the human beings had conquered nature. So uh, we could ignore that, leave that to the natural scientists who do their thing. And reality was the social realm, uh, but um, um, that's not adequate. So I, in the, re in the um, return of nature, I tried to deal with these problems. And a lot of this had the, took the form of neo-Western Marxism of the complete rejection of, of angles. And, uh, uh, Engels was seen to have uh, taken Marx into uh, dialectical materialism and dogmatism and uh, that Marx didn't adhere to the dialectics of nature, which, which is, is um, misleading uh, to say the least. Um, uh, his approach was so, somewhat different, but very, um, but um, they were, there was no real conflict between Marx and Engels in this respect. One of the things is that neo-Kantianism arose during um, Marx's lifetime and even more Engels's and Engels had to, was, was attempting to deal with it in the dialectics of nature, which he never finished. But Friedrich Lange, who wrote the history of materialism in 1865, uh, was the founder of neo-Kantianism. And the purpose of neo-Kantianism was to destroy two things. Materialist, materialism, the materialist conception of nature and Hegelian dialectics. And, uh, 
and it all it started with Lange, and then it became it was built up as this um, tradition, which then dominated German philosophy and was passed on to Western Marxism. So I mean, Marx, when he read what Lange said about himself, he says. Uh, he said, Lange is naive enough to say that I move with rare freedom in empirical matter. He hasn't the least idea that this free movement of matter is nothing but a paraphrase for the method of dealing with matter, that is the dialectic um, method. At any rate, um, Marx and uh, Engels were very opposed to the neo-Kantianism, which, which um, pushed aside materialism uh, and um, from the philosophical realm, and also um, um, went after Hegelian dialectics, and they tried to counter this. I don't have a time to, I was going to go all the way to explain uh, the nature of our Anthropocene crisis, but um, I'm going to I'm going to confine this to five more minutes because uh, um, we, you know, this is not supposed to be the full Deutscher lecture or anything remotely like that. But I did want to explain, you know, Engels's dialectics of nature, a couple of points. First of all, Engels said nature is the proof of dialectics. Now, a lot of the, the critics of Engels have snickered at that and, you know, there's various spoofs of that and sort of, but um, uh, when you translate that into our contemporary terms, um, and you say ecology is the proof of dialectics. Nobody laughs at that. No, nobody uh, thinks that um, that um, is um, a, a conception to sneeze at. In fact, that's exactly what Engels met, meant, but they, the word ecology did not um, functionally exist at, at that time. And um, I want to say something else. Uh, Engels is uh, three, so, you know, he, he called them in the language of the time, the three laws of dialectics. Uh, the first being the, um, the transformation of quantity into quality and vice versa. The second being the unity of opposites. The, the third being the negation of the negation. These three laws um, are often criticized as di dogmatic and nonsensical and so on, but that's hardly the case. First of all, you have to understand that these are what we call now in the scientific literature ontological principles. So these are three ontological principles. And the, 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 uh, the um, first principle of the transformation of quantity into quality and vice versa is what um, is understood in science as phase change or phase transition or threshold effect. In fact, the phase change concept was introduced by a Marxist mathematician, Hyman um, Levy in the, in, um, the 1930s. Uh, and um, the, the, um, the second ontological principle, the unity of opposites or identity of opposites, or as, as uh, Lukács says, the identity uh, of identity and non-identity, whatever, this has become the, the primary area of dialectics uh, for, for Marxist theorists. Now it's not really in question, but all by itself, it's fairly empty. Uh, the, um, uh, as as uh, Ernst Bloch said, um, the Hegel is the first thinker to see um, dialectics, not in terms of static relations, but in terms of dy dynamic developmental relations. And that's what's missing there. The third one, the negation of the negation, uh, that would um, that could um, uh, be developed in different ways, but it's very much related to Ernst Bloch's notion of the not yet or Boscar's notion of the absenting of absence. Um, it's about how um, the, as, as um, J.D. Barnell explained, um, the residuals of the past enter, that are seemingly left behind, enter into the transformation of the present, negating it and creating a new future. And that can be explained in very materialist terms and has been. Um, but if you look at these three ontological principles, what the first one is, is understood as as a technically constituting emergence, that is, 
um, new integrative levels, new systems of order as science has it, um, resulting from changes in quantity, new assemblages. And the, um, the second, the, um, the identity of, of, of opposites or unity of opposites is all about contradiction. It's, it's about kind of the mediating force. Uh, the third ontological principle is really about emergence, but in a developmental sense, in a historical and developmental sense where, where the past affects the present and the future. As we can say, the past mediates between the present and the future. And this is absolutely fundamental to understanding. There's not anything minor about this. In the, um, the British um, Marxists themselves, building on these kinds of foundations, building actually on, on Epicurean materialism, which they, they traced forward uh, much like Marx himself did. And they all read his doctoral dissertation and, uh, and um, so they had a very similar approach to materialist conception of nature um, as, as did Marx, as well as um, Engels' dialectics of nature. And the, the, the developments, the scientific breakthroughs are absolutely amazing. Uh, e. Ray Lancaster, who was Darwin, Marx's, Darwin and Huxley's protege and Marx's close friend, uh, was, was the greatest uh, biologist and ecological critic of uh, the late 19th and early 20th century in Britain and the, the leading evolutionary theorist. Uh, one of his theses, um, <laughs> he called it nature's revenges, but one of his theses was that all major epidemics in animals and humans in the, in the present age were products of human production and capitalism in particular. Uh, this was a, a fundamental breakthrough. Uh, he, uh, he was um, uh, very much involved in studying epidemics in his time and in Africa. And uh, uh, it's just an example. It's, it's, uh, uh, it was um, all epidemics have human causes. Uh, the Haldane's theory of the material origins of life, along with Oberon in the Soviet Union, was based on, on um, clues left behind by, by Engels and was uh, united with uh, Vernadsky, the Soviet um, um, uh, geochemist Vernadsky's uh, notion of the biosphere, which involved uh, how life created the atmosphere. Um, Haldane's role as one of the leading figures in the, in the neo-Darwinian synthesis uh, was coupled with his integration of, of the dialectics of nature based on Engels. Bernal operationalized the dialectics of nature and the, the negation of mitigation in terms of the role of residuals. Needham, Joseph Needham developed uh, integrative, a theory of integrative levels, which was the, the, you know, the, the leading uh, Marxist analysis of, of emergence, um, which materialist theorists led the way. Tansley, uh, A. G. Tansley, Arthur Tansley was like Lancaster, a kind of Fabian socialist. Uh, he was Lancaster's student. Uh, he um, he uh, was influenced by um, in Lancaster's notion of, of ecological um, nutrients and ecological cycling, and which you know Lancaster, where Lancaster overlapped with Marx and uh, Tansley in combating the eco-fascism that was developing under General Smuts in South Africa and working and um, inspired by Hyman uh, Levy uh, systems theory um, coming out of Marxism, developed the concept of ecosystem, uh, the, which became the materialist answer to, um, to idealist approaches to ecology. Uh, Haldane's, um, uh, early work with his father led to the first um, the first estimates calculations in Nature magazine of uh, carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. Um, Bernal played the reading leading role in the critique of uh, the social relations of science. Christopher Codwell um, developed um, 
a, a kind of a dialectical approach to uh, to um, both art and science interconnecting the two. Benjamin Farrington and George Thompson built on Epicurean materialism and integrated with Marxist thought. I could go on and on, but these were incredible results. And all of these thinkers made major uh, contributions to ecological analysis, um, establishing it so that they, they were the thinkers who inspired uh, figures like um, Barry Commoner in the in the um, in the um, 1950s and 60s in the United States, and and Rachel Carson and and uh, and Hutchinson, G. E. Evelyn Hutchinson, who was the student of of um, of uh, Needham, Haldane, and Lancelot Hogmans, um, another Marxist scientist. Um, and Hutchinson was was uh, was um, Hogman's uh, uh, well, protege in a way, because Hogman had introduced uh, Hutchinson to ecology. Hutchinson became known as the father of American ecology when he put the biosphere on the cover of Scientific American. But these thinkers were all interconnected. Hogman and Haldane led the way in destroying eugenics and the biological uh, theory of race, um, they completely annihilated it, um, which then um, led to the, the various unit and statements on race in the post-Second World War period. So how did this all happen? Um, and um, uh, this is what I address in my book. But I'll end with one quote by Codwell. I won't actually get to the ending that I had planned, but um, uh, Codwell said, um, the external world does not impose dialectic on thought, nor does thought impose it on the external world. The relation between, between subject and object, ego and universe is itself dialectic. Man, when he attempts to think metaphysically, contradicts himself, and meanwhile continues to live and experience reality dialectically. Uh, the, um, the 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 reason that we can understand the direct, the objective world is that we are part of it. We're emerging part of it. We belong to it with, as Engels said, with our flesh, blood, and brain, and we we transform it um, through our production. What can be called the dialectic of nature and society uh, is actually the clue to both the merely objective and the merely subjective. Dialectic. We can understand nature because we participate in it, we transform it, and we therefore learn about it as part of, of nature, as, as an imminent uh, part of, of uh, the material world. So uh, the Marxian approach completely uh, rejects dualism. It also rejects any kind of um, crude modernism. It places its, its emphasis on on the dialectics of nature and society. And this is what we most need intellectually, theoretically, and in terms of, of practice in order to deal with the ecological problem with which we are faced, the, the present planetary emergency. Thank you. John, thank you so much. This is an absolutely fascinating uh, lecture, incredibly rich. Um, I will now, uh, invite our uh, discussants to comment on John's um, uh, talk, uh, and then uh, we'll, I'll return the uh, floor to John for his uh, comments. Uh, first, um, Helena Sheehan, uh, please. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm honored uh, to be invited to discuss this very fine book, uh, which I was also um, asked to blurb. And I characterized it as a monumental work, a genealogy of eco-socialism. It's, it's, it's a massive work. At first, when I got the page proofs, I was a bit stunned to see how massive it was. And I'm the sort of person that reads every page of a book that I, I blurb. Um, but it was, it was time very, very well spent. It's, it, the, the research 
in it is just massive. And in commenting on the book and commenting on this lecture, I'm just going to uh, pick a few key themes, but it's one of these books you could, you could talk about for, for ages and ages. I think it's a very worthy winner of the Isaac and Tamara Deutscher Prize. Uh, whenever this prize is mentioned, um, it brings me back to my time when I was a member of the Communist Party of Ireland and I was reading Isaac Deutscher and admiring the work of Isaac Deutscher, which wasn't exactly done in those circles at that time. Um, and then towards the end of my time in the party, I was in London and I was in the company of Ralph Miliband, Marion Kozak, uh, Monty Johnston, and they brought me to the home of Tamara Deutscher. Uh, where I was very warmly received. And if anybody has a romantic notion of European left intellectual salons, this uh, evening actually um, fit that image. Um, and it's always been a very fond memory of, for me that always comes back whenever this prize is mentioned. So um, as the years have passed, uh, I think there's a better atmosphere between different sections of the left, which manifests itself in all kinds of ways, uh, in the ways that we work together on the Irish left. Um, but uh, it also has manifested itself over the years uh, in these historical materialism conferences. But bad as uh, the relationship sometimes was between communist parties and Trotskyist parties in those days uh, in the 1970s, one thing we tended to agree on was the dialectics of nature. Um, while the dominant position uh, in academic Marxism and in various social movements, uh, which existed at that time, uh, was that of Western Marxism which is addressed by John in, in this lecture uh, and in his books. Um, it wasn't as clean and clear as that, however, uh, because it was also at that time making inroads even into the communist parties. Um, and it was very strong in the CPGB. Um, there was a very lively debate uh, in the mid 1970s in the pages of Marxism today, which was brought to a very abrupt halt when James Klugman died and Martin Jakes became the editor. Now this position uh, was about a lot more than the dialectics of nature. Uh, and it's a lot more even than just about materialism, determinism, realism, and science. Um, it was about class, culture, politics, economics, mode of production, historical materialism. Um, all of these concepts were, were beginning to slip. Um, now, this, this Marxism today trend, the Western Marxism uh, position, it was very alert in its way to the trends of the times, but it conceded so much that it actually lost its core, uh, in my opinion. Um, and it was revising Marxism to such an extent that it was often questionable whether it was even Marxism anymore. Now, you know, they were reacting against a, a kind of dogmatic position that was there, um, often in the Soviet Union, often in communist parties. Um, I was just remembering when John was talking there about the, the three laws of dialectics, um, the sometimes, you know, very dogmatic, catechetical, is the word catechetical familiar? Maybe it's just because I grew up Catholic with the catechism, um, I don't know if that's a common word, but I, I used to think that in the Communist Party that the ways of these, these three laws of dialectics are taught was, and received was, was very catechetical. Um, and also in my research, I went back to the common turn where you know, the term uh, dialectics was used as a quasi mystical term, um, often to justify sudden lurches in common turn policy from something one day to the exact opposite of the other. And, and if anybody sort of raised a query about this, it was said, you're not being dialectical, comrade. Um, and also in, in terms of the ways these laws are presented, I remember uh, something that Terry Eagleton once said, um, kind of, you know, as he does wittily caricaturing the three laws of dialectics. And he says, um, water boils, Classes struggle and, and Lukash recants, um, which is a, a very good summary of the kind of atmosphere surrounding them. But of course, John has, has outlined them in a, in a, in a very different, um, much more plausible and, and intelligible kind of way. 
So from the time of his book, Marxism and Ecology, uh, John has entered the debates between um, two, basically these two currents uh, within Marxism. Uh, the classical Marxist tradition associated uh, with those from Engels on who refused to cede the whole realm of the natural sciences to positivism, who sought to work out a materialist worldview that embraced both human society and the natural world. The other tradition associated with neo-Kantian and neo-Hegelian polemics against positivism um, was embraced by the Frankfurt School and much of the new left, um, which was um, the, a dominant tendency when, when people the age of, of John and I uh, came onto the scene. Um, and, um, and, and this tendency argued against the idea of the dialectics of nature or even the involvement of Marxism with the whole realm of the natural sciences. Um, the, the quote in, in the, the longer written version of this lecture from uh, Perry Anderson about the, the fantasies of Bernal. And also Terry Eagleton uh, once said um, that there was nothing to be um, learned from Codwell except negatively. I think a lot of, the, of my generation, you know, 60, in, in the 1960s had a very bad attitude um, to the generation of, of the 1930s. And I found myself, although I was their age, identifying much more with this previous generation sometimes than my own. Um, although I was very, very new left in, in my early um, activism. Um, so um, in, in the Marxist, Marx and Ecology book, um, John, if I, if I remember this correctly, um, admitted to actually changing sides uh, in this debate. Um, and in doing so, he cited um, in various influences from rereading Marx himself um, to the whole legacy of monthly review, um, and also to another strain um, so it, of the new left associated um, with scientists such as Levins and Lewinton and, and Gould, who played a very important role um, in this tradition. Um, and, and so John came to argue for a comprehensive materialism, embracing um, both the physical and the social realms um, and vindicating the very progressive and intelligent um, legacy of Engels, which was being submitted to what verged on slander um, in some of the polemics um, of that time. So the Western Marxist tradition uh, saw a basic breach between a humanist Marx and a positive Engels and tended to see everything admirable in the subsequent history of Marxism as grounded in the former and everything that went astray as, as uh, to do with the latter. Um, however, a rigorous examination of both text and context makes the assertion of a theoretical gulf between Marx and Engels really untenable. Um, and John has argued that, I've argued that, other, other people have argued that um, quite plausibly. So another target for John's uh, polemics has been the tendency in ecological thought and green movements uh, to attribute the entire course of ec ec ecological degradation to the emergence of the scientific revolution of the 17th century. Um, and uh, this is seen as embodying an anthropocentric exploitative, exploitative mechanism um, to which this um, uh, romanticist, organicist, vitalist, uh, postmodernist uh, position uh, could be opposed. Uh, and as John's pointed out, this is a dualist perspective um, that's led to much of the contemporary uh, ecological movement to a crude rejection of, of modernity and science and to caricature the enlightenment to caricature um, Marxism and to, um, to, to uh, aim for some kind of, uh, to glory in some kind of irrationalist myopia. So in contrast, uh, John's work has made a strong case for Marxism as an ecological theory, and in fact, as the best possible theoretical basis for ecology. And at the core of his work is the assertion of the centrality of ecology to a materialist conception of nature and history, and the centrality of a materialist conception of nature and history to ecology. So once the ecological dimension uh, is reconceived in this way and grounded 
in a realist epistemology, in a materialist ontology, it can be seen that the obstacles to a rational metabolism of nature and society lie not in modernity, not in science, not in materialism, but in the capitalist mode of production. So this perspective, I think, brings great clarity to our current conjuncture. And it's no wonder that there is a resurgence of interest in what Marxism brings to our current crises. Now, in this lecture, which John ha has entitled uh, The Return of the Dialectics of Nature, um, he cites the current planetary emergency as the major force in citing this, which is obviously the case. But I would also add uh, certain other factors. Uh, one would definitely be the current pandemic, which I think has brought fresh interest uh, in, in Mar the Marxist tradition with respect to science. Um, and there's also the fact that the alternative approaches, the various varieties of neo-positivism and postmodernism, simply don't do the job. They simply fail uh, at an explanatory level. And people are looking around for something that is more comprehensive more coherent and beginning to, to, to at least respect Marxism um, for this um, and hopefully they'll, they'll progress from there. Now, I've taken a, a somewhat polemical tone here, not, not a polemic between John and I, uh, because we, we basically hold the same position, but uh, between this position and, and, um, and other trends. Um, uh, Tommy Jackson, uh, a member of the CPGB who, who wrote a book called Dialectics once said that a crowd would gather for a dog fight that would be scattered by a sermon. So I wanna say a final word um, about um, historical materialist conferences in recent years um, and the, the philosophy, uh, the presence of philosophy in historical materialist conferences. Uh, I've noticed a tendency to articulate uh, the various positions present as Althusser, either Althusserian or Hegelian. Um, and I've, I've, I o I've always found this kind of odd and, and um, disorienting uh, because I, I'm neither of these. Uh, and then I was saying, well, what am I? How, how would I characterize my position? Um, I regard my position as mainstream Marxism. Um, I always saw myself in this tradition that John has outlined in, in his book and his lecture here, in the tradition of, of Engels, Caldwell, Bernal, Haldane, Levins, Lewinton, and of course now Foster. Um, and uh, I'm very happy that this prize um, and, and this discussion tonight is honoring that tradition and perhaps playing a part in mainstreaming it again. Um, because I think it is mainstream Marxism. Thank you, Elena. This is fantastic. Thank you very much for that. Um, Stefano, please. Hi, thanks. So um, I'm very pleased to have been asked to discuss John's important work tonight. Thanks for inviting me. Um, you know, I've John's work has influenced me for my whole career, basically, and um, I'm very honored to be part of this. Um, but I'm, I'm going to uh, focus my comments on the contributions to uh, modern ecological critique that, that John has provided in his works in both Mar Marx's ecology and the return of nature and how this, as I see it, advances a, a critical sustainability science and how desperately such an approach is needed. And, and this is kind of getting out into how this is applied in, uh, in, in research on, on sustainability issues. And so in The Return of Nature, John, I think goes beyond showing that historical materialism as developed by Marx and Engels is, is relevant for sociological, uh, socio-ecological analysis or, or that it can be applied in, in some ways, but that it is in fact foundational a foundational approach for the, the development of, of the ecological sciences and for sustainability studies. And even if, if fairly recently, it 
this has been declared irrelevant or even considered unproductive in its so-called Prometheanism, John has shown that, that, that that's inaccurate and in how foundational it, it is. So in, in a true radical form, John digs deep in, you can see when you're reading the book, the, the amount of detail um, into the historical record of a, of a dialectical analysis and how it facilitated the development of fundamental concepts in the ecological and biological sciences as, as he was talking about. So this work together with, with Marx's ecology, and I think John's made it clear that this is big, one big project, I think, and um, uh, they, they have provide, provided these uh, essential foundations for what John calls a unified ecological critique. And it provides what I think is the possibility of, of a, a, for a, a critical sustainability science. So the return of nature makes explicit and clear the, the foundational role of this approach uh, for modern sustainability science. And as John explains, it carries forward the, the, the basis provided by Marx uh, over the next century after his and, and Darwin's deaths. Uh, the analysis developed over this time, as, as John stated, you know, it represented not simply a, a critical economics, but a new approach to science and science in general and how we understand the world. So by developing the synthesis and putting these historical pieces together, John enhances the potential for a comprehensive and systematic approach for the analysis of socio-ecological processes in, in the modern era. And so that, that's to say that the work is not simply of historical significance or setting the record straight, that it is that, those things, uh, but it threads together the wealth of knowledge and historical materialist thought for the further development of a, a, a modern critical sustainability science, which is to be, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, a holistic interdisciplinary science. Uh, more specifically, uh, I think John in, uh, provides us a great detail about the essential power of a, of a dialectical approach for, for this and, and, and for a critical scientific understanding in, in an era in which we face, as we know, in, uh, an unprecedented uh, ecological challenge. So as I said, I've, I've been inspired by the analytical approach that uh, John's work has provided and, and I've tried to apply this in, in my own in environmental sociology and sustainability science. I, I've tried to use it to better understand socio-ecological processes in, for example, fishing systems and food production and, and the social structural drivers of environmental change. Um, so as a result, it's forced me to grapple with some difficult questions, methodological questions like for starters, uh, how does one study the complex system that is modern society? Uh, what does a socio-ecological analysis look like today? Uh, how do we effectively apply the social metabolism concept and develop it? Develop a, a thoroughgoing dialectical, historical, materialist, socio-ecological analysis? And can this provide the basis for critical science, critical sustainability science? So uh, I, you know, I go back to Marx's ecology and, and, and John in, in the talk that's on YouTube clarifies that a full materialist outlook developed by Marx's three aspects. And that's at the beginning of Marx's ecology, the one ontological materialism, two epistemological materialism and, and three practical materialism. And I think these three aspects can be seen as methodological guiding threads for research design and analysis. That is how do we develop uh, sustainability research that draws on the important insights of historical materialism laid down by, by Marx and Engels. And each of these, I think, provides important insights, right? One, in terms of the ontological materialism, that social science can develop analysis which takes seriously the materialist conception of nature underlying the materialist conception of history, right? Uh, this, this is uh, fundamental for doing that. Two, in terms of epistemological materialism, that, that we can apply a critical realist approach, one that analyzes the society nature dialectic and makes efforts to bridge the social and natural science disciplinary divisions. And, and three, in practical materialism, uh, that when we're doing this work, human praxis must be 
a point of departure. That is, labor and the production process need to be central to the analysis. So this sets the stage for developing this kind of critical analysis and the critical sustainability science research that allows for a dialectical historical materialist approach. One that develops, as Marx suggests in his, in his letter to Arnold Ruger, a ruthless criticism of everything existing. So as John states, we have to approach such studies in a critical way. A critical sociological, socio-ecological approach must be historical, materialist, and dialectical. It, one that can be scientific yet not positivist or reductionist. Uh, it is materialist, but not mechanical or determinist. It, it emphasizes change and contradiction, but it's not tele teleological. It's an approach that can analyze culture, but in a materialist constant, context. So uh, Marx argued that adopting such an approach allowed for what he called genuine scientific research rather than apologetics. So in, in Hegel, Marx and Engels found, you know, uh, discovered the power of, of, of the dialectical approach as a method and also the necessity of critical analysis. And in The Return of Nature, John details the importance of this for Marx and Engels and then for the ecological thinkers that followed them over the next century. And the, the important contributions that they made to ecological thought that were based in these uh, analytical insights that came from um, uh, the, this, uh, this, this approach, this dialectical approach. So um, this, the return of nature makes clear that socialist thinkers were integral to the development of modern scientific knowledge and that this was not a coincidence, but it was directly related to how they understood and analyzed the world through a dialectical historical materialist approach. It wasn't just a random uh, fact that these, all these thinkers were socialist. It was tied into the way that they analyzed the, uh, the nature. And, um, and the, it, essential to this was a critical, the, the critical aspect of the analysis where, as John states, nature and humanity had to be, con be conceived in historical terms. But one thing I wanted to mention here, and maybe something that you know John might speak to at some point, it seems to me that the advancement of this analytical approach that has been has been somewhat limited in much of environmental uh, or sustainability science research uh, at, at, of late. Um, and I was hoping that we might be able to talk about this more, because with this book, he makes such a strong argument for adopting this type of ecological analysis. Um, and uh, for example, in modern sustainability, science uh, is a field that is at the forefront of, of these matters, of these issues of ecological crisis. And John has produced tremendous insights on, on sustainability um, concerns, and, and this field has been important to him, right? For example, um, John has drawn on, and I have as well, on research from the Stockholm Resilience Center on planetary boundaries for clarifying the, the dire threat that humanity faces as we transcend these planetary boundaries. And these thinkers have done a great service in clarifying these kind of ecological challenges and the serious nature of, uh, of, of, of them for the future and calling for a change of course. But they have largely failed at recognizing the socio-historical significance uh, of, this, of the change that's required and you often you, turning to markets and technology and corporate leaders and, and politicians uh, for answers. And uh, unfortunately, modern sustainability scientists have not been very good at recognizing and drawing on the important insights that can, that can emerge from a critical ecology. And clearly this is ironic in the context of the return of nature as the scientific thinkers in the book have been essential to the development of the science. So we see, for example, uh, the, uh, those uh, in, in modern sustainability science offering conceptions of resilience of social ecological systems or coupled human natural systems in sometimes quite superficial and even functionalist ways. Uh, we see major research projects in this realm that focus on corporate environmental stewardship, which for one argues that the concentration and consolidation in, in industries can have benefits for sustainability. We see the development of institutes emerging that promote so-called um, sustainable finance uh, in this realm as well. So this is often regarded as the cutting edge of sustainability research and published in leading journals like Science and Nature. 
Yet the social analysis, they, they often amounts to little more than armchair assumptions about socio historical conditions and, and it lacks serious political economic analysis. We also see the development of sustainability research, which uh, considers itself critical or e maybe even Marxist. And some of it has drawn on the metabolism concept, but are missing this, what, what, what John has laid out, this dialectical historical materials conception. Um, uh, and where at times metabolism, the concept of metabolism is used simply as a metaphor or as an industrial metabolism in, in very mechanical ways. So obviously I think that this modern sustainability science overlooks the critical ecological approach that John has done so much to explain at, at its peril and at all, all of our peril. Um, I have ideas about why this is maybe, but uh, if there's time, it would be great to hear John's thoughts on uh, why this lack of uptake by uh, has, has uh, which appears to me to be, you know, pro problematic considering that it has the potential to bridge discipline and is quite suitable for sustainability studies uh, and particularly the analytical insights that's were brought out by the, that are brought out by the, the society nature dialectic. So as, as many of us have consistently argued, humanity, humanity is at a point of, of reckoning. And it seems to me that the dialectical historical materialist approach so powerful, powerfully elaborated by John in, in his major works uh, is essential if we are going to have any chance at moving towards sustainable human, human development. And um, I think this is uh, 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 something that needs to be uh, uh, understood and addressed uh, broadly in the sustainability uh, science community and, um, in, and in uh, uh, the research realm. So with that, I give it back to you. Thank you, Stefano. Thank you very much for that. So John, if you would like to comment uh, on the um, intervention by the discussions, uh, and then we can um, take questions from the audience. Um, when I when I heard Alina's talk, I thought, well, my introduction here wasn't my summary of my uh, Deutscher lecture wasn't uh, that necessary because Alina's actually covered the ground quite well in a different way in her reflections. I thought I think would have been a, a fabulous introduction to uh, this whole topic and, and um, I'm honored by the things that she said. I, I too think that, uh, that I belong to mainstream Marxist tradition, although I don't know if I, I like using mainstream related to Marxism at all, but, but uh, certainly a critical Marxist a tradition that um, builds on classical uh, Marxism and its fundamental concepts, particularly in the areas that we've been talking about, and how odd it is uh, to, as as Lena said, to have uh, people think that uh, um, Marxian philosophy or uh, is is uh, boils down to Althusserianism versus uh, Hegelianism, and uh, uh, we 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 certainly. I learned a lot from those debates. I certainly learned a lot from, from my studies of Hegel and from critical theory and Frankfurt School and um, even um, uh, Althusserianism. But um, those, those, um, those debates were significant, but we have to move on to a new period. And what we're actually talking about is the reunification of the Marxian critique on classical grounds. I, I explained it as in terms of a chasm between the official Soviet Marxism and Western Marxism primarily. And over the dialectics of nature, the materialist conception of nature and so on. And um, obviously there were political differences as well, but the, the th theoretical arguments really rested on these points. We have to um, develop an analysis that supersedes those one-sided positions and allows us to uh, move forward with the dialectics of, of nature and society with a materialist conception of, of nature and 
together with the materials conception of history. And this doesn't mean discarding anything altogether. It means uh, reconfiguring and, and uh, superseding um, in, in a dialectical way, uh, the, the uh, divisions that lay between us. Certainly it's no longer possible to uh, be a meaningful critical thinker at all and to leave uh, the universal metabolism of nature, that is the natural world as a whole and the human relation within it outside of the analysis. We can no longer afford to subsume nature in society. We can no longer afford to perpetuate uh, dualist uh, conceptions. Even sometimes in the name of anti-dualism, we find uh, thinkers promoting dualist rather than dialectical conceptions. And I think Helena and I are, are agreed on that. I think uh, Marxist theory is going this direction as material conditions change, um, so we, do we rediscover uh, the, the power of, of our own uh, critical analysis. So um, I, I just thought that um, Helena's analysis uh, was wonderful. I agreed with it all and I would, I would um, happily uh, substitute it for, for my own statements. It's, it's um, uh, so good in that way. So the one thing though that Delina brought up that um, in terms of um, planetary emergency or, or also including the, the uh, COVID pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic, of course, that's the way I look at it. The way I look at planetary emergency and I actually plan to say more about, the, about that at the end of the talk, but I realized I had too much material, uh, but um, the planetary emergency, I, I think of very much in terms of what, what uh, Stefano said, the planetary boundaries. The, in, the, in the conception of planetary boundaries in science, uh, the, uh, we, we're in earth system science, there's an anthropogenic rift, a term introduced um, to define the Anthropocene crisis, the early, you know the initial stage of the Anthropocene, and the anthropogenic rift consists in our crossing of the various planetary boundaries, not climate change only, which is of course the most uh, uh, present in our minds, but also uh, species extinction or biological diversity crossing boundaries in in that area the um, disruption of the phosphorus and nitrogen cycles, the uh, destruction of, of ground cover and principally forests, the uh, desertification, loss of fresh water, the um, uh, chemical uh, crisis, the spread of, of toxic bio accumulating and biomagnifying toxics and and, um, and uh, radioact radionuclides. And uh, all of these, and of course the um, ocean acidification and uh, depletion of the ozone layer, which is not as critical uh, now, but is a serious issue. Uh, all of these are planetary boundaries that we uh, have crossed or in the process of crossing that each one of them represents a global ecological crisis threatening humanity. And they all have a common denominator of capitalism. And I've actually argued that, um, that uh, zoonoses, the creation of uh, the development of new zoonoses as a result of agribusiness should be added as a 10th planetary uh, boundary um, as part of this same uh, anthropogenic rift, which is further complicated um, by climate change. So this is a um, way of understanding the ecological crisis that we're in, and we can't reduce it just to climate change. Uh, I mean, even at the global level, um, and we can't reduce it just to climate change because all of these other global ecological crises are occurring concurrently. They overlap in various ways with climate change, obviously, but uh, each one of these 
represents uh, a threat to the very existence of humanity. For example, ocean acidification has been associated with the, the, the uh, massive die downs in Earth, Earth history um, prior to the sixth extinction, uh, our current um, uh, movement in that direction. So uh, I think we, we need to have this broad conception of planetary emergency. And of course, we don't want to conceive it just that way. We have to understand that it's rooted in capitalism. It's rooted in environmental injustice, expropriation of land and people's bodies, what Brett Clark and I and Hannah Holman called the corporeal rift. And uh, all of these things are, are um, related in part of the planetary emergency. And, and I've referred to the Anthropocene crisis, but uh, the, the Anthropocene itself is defined as, as um, uh, the ep epoch when uh, human beings, when anthropogenic forces are the main factor in Earth system change. Uh, the only way we're going to get out of that is through an Anthropocene extinction event that uh, annihilates um, the species on the Earth. Um, you know, the majority of species on the earth, including ourselves. Otherwise, we are going to remain in the Anthropocene because um, industrial civilization, the very existence of industrial civilization, whether it's capitalism or socialism, means that from now on, uh, what we do uh, affects the earth system. Uh, it's, that's not going to go away. It's what what matters is whether we are able to, to develop a system that's sustainable and co-evolves with their system, or one um, as in present, uh, the capitalist system, which is, uh, is um, headed towards an Anthropocene extinction event. Um, we're, in, we're going rapidly in that direction. We can still control it, stop it, but we are headed in that direction. Now, the way to understand this more concretely, some people have tried to um, substitute the notion of capitalocene for anthropocene, but that's a, um, um, that's a category mistake. The capitalocene doesn't really have any meaning in defining a, a geological epic. Uh, and the, 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 it misses the main point of the anthropocene discussion, which is that that human beings are now, um, anthropogenic factors are now the main factor in changing their system. And that's not going to go away unless we go away. So the better way to look at it is to look at it in terms of where we have this new age sciences uh, of the Anthropocene, sorry, the new epic of the Anthropocene. But every geological age, I mean, every geological epic, sorry, every geological epic epic is, uh, has ages within it, geological ages within it. Officially, we are living in the Meghalian age, which started 4,200 years ago and is the last age of the Holocene epic. And the Meghalian age was associated, at least when they first conceived it, with, um, with the uh, first destruction of civilizations due to climate uh, change. Um, and um, not anthropogenic climate change, but, but due to climate change. And, uh, but what, with the Anthropocene, with the rise of the Anthropocene epic, we are in a new age, but science has not said what that age is. What is that geological age? Well, that geological age is now determined by the social system. So Brett Clark and I have proposed that it be called the Capitolinian. And uh, because it derives from capitalism. And our object has to be to end the Capitolinian by 2050, which is the marker for net, um, uh, a net zero carbon, and enter a, a new age, which will require an ecological revolution of the communion where we have a sustainable relation to the earth. So this is sort of a way to understand what the bigger issues are. So I wasn't actually ignoring the pandemic and referring to the planetary emergency. I think it's a central aspect of it. I would call it the 10th planetary boundary. 
the um, I I found Stefano's remarks also um, really uh, wonderful and and uh, a great introduction and um, a different uh, window on what I've been doing and are trying to do and um, I. I, I love, the, of course, the notion of the, trying to develop a foundational approach for a critical ecological science and the emphasis on the three um, uh, aspects of any fully developed materialism, which I'm, I didn't have time to talk about, but is in the Deutsche um, lecture paper, the ontological materialism based on the notion that that human beings uh, um, or that uh, that nature, uh, the physical world exists prior to and in and uh, in many ways independent of human beings. That it's an asymmetric relationship with human beings as an emergent part of nature, but dependent on the physical natural world around them. This is a fundamental materialist ontological perspective. Uh, which Marxists have often have recently tended to forget, epistemological materialism, which I think is is best understood in terms of dialectical critical realism, and uh, I think Boscar is very helpful in that. But ultimately, practical materialism, and practical materialism doesn't mean just social practice. It means that human beings, um, in their production, in Marx's terms are engaged in a social metabolism with nature. So it creates a dialectic of nature and society, which is, which is the basis for our understanding of the ontological materialism. Um, it's, it's actually um, how uh, human beings belong as, as Lukács argued in his ontology of social being. It's, it's the ontology of social being of human beings and uh, it also is the basis of our epistemology. How do we understand the world? In Marxist terms, we understand it because of our practical relation to it. So I think that, that bringing that out was very important. I don't know in terms of like the, the science, you know, to what extent are scientists not um, failing to, are failing to um, bring in uh, these social scientists scientific conceptions. I just read a book by Michael Mann, where, you know, he's been a very great um, a climatologist, but on, on, on social science, he, he attacks, um, he attacks um, all sorts of people connected to, to, to me, and he attacks uh, Naomi Klein, he can tax, um, uh, well, he attacks a whole lot of figures on the left, and, um, and, you uh, he he says that that Biden represents the um, the uh, telogen ecological course, um, and he doesn't seem to have any conception of capitalism whatsoever. Marx continually raised questions about. This. He said, like natural scientists are are um, extraordinary in their insights, but when they leave their domain and they enter social science, they often muck it up. He. He talked about Liebig as, as messing up once he tried to go beyond the natural scientific domain. And there's, there's problems with this. It's the way science is incor incorporated into capitalism. Uh, J.D. Bernal always said, and it's based in Marx and Engels, that a rational science is impossible under capitalism. Um, we can have elements of rational science, but a rational science overall and its implementation is is impossible to under, science, under capitalism. That doesn't mean we have to reject science. We need to incorporate um, what is meaningful and, and powerful and uh, important and what's dialectical, but we also need to remain critics and we need to Im impress upon science the, the need to under social, understand social science, which is a problem because the social science is even more of a mess than the natural science, in my opinion. And in the environmental realm, uh, the dominant social science is economics. And, uh, and so um, we, we gave a, a Nobel Prize in, in well, the, the Nobel Committee, so-called, uh, gave a, a Nobel Prize to Nordhaus for, you know, who, who basically argued that for decades that we should, shouldn't 
really do anything on climate change. We should we should drag our feet and uh, on climate change and play down the problem. And uh, and uh, so we have real problems in social science. And we have problems in natural science. Rob Wallace, who's a really great epidemiologist, who I think is an heir to Levins and Lewontin and this whole dialectical tradition, has been the leading figure in explaining uh, the, the nature of the pandemic. And of course, writing for Month Review, with, um, but and incorporating the metabolic rift into his analysis, he's been the most formidable thinker. But but Rob Wallace was was driven out of a job because. Why? Uh, why? Why was he um, driven out of? Because he was raising the question of, of a pandemic, of a serious pandemic re resulting from agribusiness conditions. And so they pushed him out of employment, something I wouldn't mention, except that he's, he's the kind of person that explains it very proudly in his own books. And uh, so we have problems like that. Um, and um, I don't know what the answer is, but we're 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 getting we're moving forward. The movements are beginning to embrace eco-socialism. And as Mark said, you know, when he asked, when he was asked, uh, well, what is um, the what the answer is struggle. So in the intellectual realm, we have to struggle as well. Um, thanks, Helena and Stefano. John, thank you very much. We have uh, quite a few questions that came up in the chat. So I'll just read the questions and ask John for his comments on all these questions that we have already got at the same time. That's in the interests of, uh, of time. And then if Helena and Stefano would like to uh, make quick comments uh, after John, that would, be, uh, that would be welcome too. So uh, first question is, uh, Professor Foster believes that the ecological crises will persist regardless of the persistence of capitalism. What does it take to stop the crises then? The second is, what do the panelists make of Sebastiano Timpanaro? Engels and uh, dialectics of nature was important for that thinker. For, for that thinker. Um, then could John make his understanding of ontology clearer? Is it uh, dialectical materialism in the field of science predominantly? What else? Um, I have a couple of comments about um, what is uh, dialectical materialism, if John, John may or may not want to, uh, to comment on, on that. Then I'm curious to hear Professor Foster's or others comments on Alfred Schmidt's uh, Marxist concept of nature. Currently reading it and find it incredibly illuminating. So John, this is, uh, these are the questions we've got uh, so far. Uh, I didn't the, catch the last one. Oh, you, um, I'm curious to hear Professor Foster's uh, thoughts on Alfred Schmidt's um, Marxist concept of nature. I presume it's the title of a book. I am currently reading it and finding it incredibly illuminating. I have not seen this book, but the title is interesting. John. Okay. I, I will try to give very short answers to this so we get more questions, more discussion, and I've talked enough. But in terms of uh, e ecological crises uh, persisting beyond capitalism, I think that the, the, um, the question is in response to my description of the Anthropocene, where um, in according to the science, uh, the human beings, um, the, the Anthropocene, Pagenic um, factor is the is the main force in in uh, altering the Earth system. That's because our our global economy has grown so large, because um, uh, the you know the the industrialization, the expansion of the human role on the Earth. Even if we 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 uh, create a kind of a steady state economy, uh, we're not going to change all that. We're the science says that we're going to remain the major factor in in um, in determining Earth system change. So that doesn't mean that we will be in in absolute crisis. Right now, we're in an Anthropocene crisis caused by capitalism, what I've called the 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 Capitolinian age um, in in geological terms, and we're in a crisis because of of um, carbon emissions into the 
uh, atmosphere and all the other factors you know about, we can we can um, work to to um, uh, reduce our fossil fuel emissions to 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 uh, get to zero emissions. We can do other things to restore forests and 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 restore fresh water. There's all sorts of things we can do uh, to come back into accord with what could be called nature's laws. At least there's certain natural biophysical limits. Uh, we could stop using so many um, pesticides and fertilizers, the fertilizers that are say disrupting uh, the uh, waterways of all of the earth, uh, disrupting the ocean. We could decrease our use of these chemical fertilizers. We can do all of these things, but the truth is that we're kind of on permanently on a knife's edge now because the, the um, human uh, society economy has expanded re in relation to the biogeochemical cycles of the planet. And so when we were a small economy, it didn't matter what we did, that we couldn't affect the earth system. Now everything we do has the potential of, of um, affecting the earth system. So Marx said that we have to um, actually argue that we had to have a sustainable relation to the earth. Um, we had to be good heads of the household and protect the chain of human generations. We can have a society that does that, but we can't, um, we can't treat it. Uh, we can't treat the planet anymore that as if there are no boundaries, there are no limits, and we have to conform to that. So even if 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 we um, eliminated the capitalism or the capitalinian, and we entered a more sustainable age, it doesn't mean that there won't be ecological crises or problems. Right now, we know that um, that uh, the science tells us that sea level rise is going to continue this century, all of this century, and maybe for a millennium. Um, but, but regardless of what we do, sea level rise is going to increase this whole century. It's, it, um, it may not increase as much if we, it won't increase as much if we take action, but there's no way we can turn it around. It's not possible to to um, to do that, so we are in this period where, yeah, we're more of a, on a knife edge in relation to the the planet. We have to be aware of planetary boundaries, but that doesn't mean that we will always have an ecological crisis in the sense of right now. Uh, in terms of uh, sub, um, Tipperneros' um, work on materialism, uh, it, it was useful in in criticizing. Western Marxism, but he treated nature as passive. So he, he basically rejected the dialectics of nature, even though he insisted on materialism. And, and nature was a, simply a passive entity. And uh, so his, his, um, his conception of, of ecological issues is very limited. Uh, he's, he's useful in one sense, but not another. In terms of ontology just means the nature of being. It's a, a a word we now use for what used to be called metaphysics, which was, was um, you know, a negative term, became a negative term. Uh, but we realized that that um, you can't have a rational philosophy of, of any kind unless you have some conception of the nature of being. And that's what ontology is about. In terms of um, 150 years of almost total failure of dialectical materialism, well, <laughs> That's a complicated issue, but I, I, I don't agree because um, well, there are different versions of dialectical materialism, as I explained. Um, and uh, I actually think that Engels' approach is probably better called dialectical naturalism. But in terms of um, the red scientists we were looking at, in terms of the, the whole British tr tradition, including um, thinkers who were dealing with aesthetics and so on, um, you have you have this development of, of an ecological tradition, the foundational notions of ecology coming out of what is very clearly um, a, a dialectical materialist um, tradition. So how you could call that a failure when it's the basis of, um, of our modern ecological understanding and say it's a 150 years of total failure, I, 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 um, 
you know, I simply can cannot believe that there were failures among dialectical materialist thinkers, but I never judge a particular tradition by the worst thinkers. I always try to judge a tradition by its best thinkers and see what I can learn and throw out the garbage. So there, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of, um, of failures, but the um, but uh, the successes in ecological sense are just um, tremendous. We wouldn't really have um, a th the theory of systems ecology we have now if it weren't for the um, dialectical materials tradition. In terms of Alfred Schmidt's uh, concept of nature, I've written quite a lot criticizing it. He comes out of the Frankfurt School. His, you know, his mentors were Horkheimer and Adorno. And he basically, um, uh, there are a lot of good things in, in his book. And they, he actually says at one point that, um, that Marx's notion of metabolism is, is the only meaningful approach to the dialectics of nature. But then, but then he, he later repudiates that. Uh, he, he basically came out of the Frankfurt School, adopted the dialectics of enlightenment view of of Horkheimer and Adorno that said, yeah, well, we, it's terrible, the, the con concept of the domination of nature um, that the Enlightenment brought, but ultimately we have to accede to it because there's no alternative. There is no ecological depth in his analysis. Um, and I think the, the analysis is idealistic and upside down and um, but I've written a, a lot about it I think you can you can find um, my discussion with it and with Brett Clark in um, my book the robbery of nature um, it's a, a, a piece on Marxism and the left is that all the questions we've got some a couple more questions and maybe if you could, um, we've got about 10 minutes, no more than that um, because of the following sessions in the conference. And then uh, if you could go briefly, then Helena and Stefano maybe could comment as well. Um, ecological crisis is purely descriptive, useless to serve as a definition since definition must capture essence. So we should call this uh, crisis by its name, the capitalist destruction of nature. As a comment, uh, not a question, perhaps for your um, um, feelings about this. And then so, something about um, Schmidt. Um, and then a comment that your analysis is really inspiring, but it seems very pessimistic. Are you pessimistic, John? I'm glad that question was asked. But in terms of John Smith's question, uh, uh, whether we should call it the capitalist destruction of nature, uh, that you know that's fine with me, but but um, I we've introduced the notion of the Capitolinian as the the geological age that we're in, and uh, rooted on capitalism, the, the it's the Capitolinian crisis. Of course, um, science has not agreed with us yet to to. Um, uh, call the the first age of the Anthropocene the Capitolinian, but we're the first ones to give it a name. The very first to give the first the 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 um, opening age of the of the Anthropocene a name, and we're calling it the Capitolinian, and we're explaining that it stands for uh, for, for Anthropocene crisis for, for capitalism's destruction of, of nature, which we have to rise above by creating a new society and a new geological age, uh, which we call the communion, which we also introduce. The Capitolinian has to be superseded by the communion. It's not so much um, we should talk about uh, capitalism's destruction of the earth, um, but we should talk about uh, even more than that, we should talk about uh, what we want to create beyond it. And uh, it has to be a communion age based on the, no, the named after community, commune, uh, communal. And it has to be based on a socialist society with ecological sustainability, 
substantive equality and sustainable human development. In terms of, um, of um, my analysis being pessimistic, uh, well, I, I, I am, but I didn't actually get to the optimistic part. I, I ran out of time, but um, the, uh, you can see it in the Deutsche lecture. The, uh, the argument is that we need to fight for a new, um, a new geological age, a new society, the communion. We need to carry out a great climateric that gets us there. But um, the, the actual point of my, my talk and, and uh, the um, subtitle of the talk is I have this thesis, which I don't have time to explain fully now, but my thesis is that revolutionary situations are, are determined by the coincidence of the struggle for freedom, which always exists in human history, and the struggle for necessity. When the two coincide, we have a revolutionary situation and we have an emerging revolutionary situation. The struggle for, revolu of free for freedom coinciding with the struggle for necessity on a global scale now. None of us know what is going to happen. The science and any kind of materialism reality tells us of the dangers that capitalism has brought us to. Uh, there is the whole question of going off the edge of the cliff metaphorically, although it won't be uh, that um, we're, we're a long ways from, from still from, from um, that and we, we still have room to do things. But the, the important thing to understand is that nothing is really stable. We've reached a point where social institutions can no longer be considered stable. If we get to a four degree um, Celsius increase in global average temperature, the science says that industrial civilization will collapse globally. And that actually is where we're headed right now, this century during the lifetime of people um, all over the planet, if we don't do something about it. And social institutions are fragile in these circumstances. And, and uh, we can't, we, um, we can't um, claim that they're going to remain stable. They won't, uh, there will be change. But we also know, and this is the really important part, is that hundreds of millions of people, even billions of people are going to engage in the struggle in our time to try to um, preserve a, a, the earth as, as a safe home for a humanity and to protect their, con their conditions and lives and to struggle for freedom and necessity. This is the, we're gonna see the greatest movements that the world has ever seen. And I don't know what the result is gonna be but, and nobody does, but it's open. Um, the, um, the population of the earth has not yet spoken, but they will speak. And uh, so I don't know if you call this optimism or pessimism. I think it's revolutionary optimism, which is always based on materialist foundations and recognizes the difficulties that lie ahead. Thank you so much, John, this is fantastic. Uh, Helena and Stefano, one minute each. Okay, um, I'm just going to focus, since I only have one minute, I'm only going to focus on this question, has dialectical materialism failed for 150 years? Um, my answer to that is an emphatic no. Um, very many um, intelligent, incredible people, such as many of the people that we've all cited um, tonight have believed in it. Um, but in any case, truth is not a matter of, of majority vote. Uh, there are far more people that believe today in fundamentalist Christianity or Islam than believe in Marxism, but are they right? Um, there are even more people, um, including intellectuals, and I'm finding this especially among younger intellectuals, um, who have not worked out um, a clear worldview. They've not really laid firm foundations for the way they think. And so, you know, their academic work is constantly at bay. They're flailing about, there's no core to them. Um, and it's, it, it, it's a mess. 
Um, and uh, the person that wrote that comment uh, in, in the comments box said that it was uh, too vague and confused to be of any practical use. Well, all I can say is that um, it's the most practical thing in the world to me because it affects the way I think about everything every day um, because I have laid you know, clear foundations uh, and have a clear worldview and it affects the way I think about everything. And to me, that is like totally practical and clear. And I think that Marxism illuminates the world in a way that nothing else on the horizon does. I think it's still the unsurpassed philosophy um, of our time. Okay, well, then, uh, Stefano. Yeah, I, not much time, but I'll just uh, comment on the, the notion of pessimism and. And I mean, you know, I think, I mean, John said it well, so I don't need to say much about it, but you know, the, the reality that, uh, I mean, this is a, a realist examination and uh, actually is quite optimistic in the sense that um, it opens up opportunities in, a, in a, uh, this uh, uh, eco-socialist analysis, uh, examining the world this way provides us with a potential for where we go moving forward um, beyond capital, right? And so I, I, I disagree with the notion that it's pessimistic. I mean, realistically, yes, we've, we're facing some uh, serious challenges, but um, we have to recognize those serious challenges and think about how to supersede them. So, I mean, John said it well, but then I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Stefano. Thank you, Helena. And thank you very much, John, for your fantastic presentation. And congratulations again uh, on your prize. Your work is amazing and extremely important at this moment uh, in time. Thank you, everyone who has uh, participated, contributed, uh, watched. Uh, the video uh, is uh, available. It will continue to be available. Um, thank you so much uh, to Historical Materialism for hosting the Deutsche Prize uh, lecture and publishing uh, the uh, lecture uh, by the prize winner every year. It's a very strong relationship that we value uh, enormously. So thank you very much to the journal. Uh, thanks, everyone. And uh, thank you for coming here. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Nice to meet you, Helena.